You are watching the Sunbeam Alpine channel. If you are interested in alpines, this channel is for you. In this video, we will be talking to the men behind the development of the Club Weber Carburetor. Eddie Zetlin and Peter Peskov. This carburetor and curve manifold setup has taken the alpine world by storm, improved performance across the range and massively increased fuel economy. This is the story of how it came about. Right, I'm here now with uh, two of the prime movers behind the Weber Club Carburetor system with the curve manifold. This is Peter Pescud and Eddie Zetlin. Hi guys. Hi, Hi Tim. Now, you guys, were the reason that this actually came to pass and we ended up with the Club Weber being manufactured. Can you tell us a bit about the history, how it came to happen? Well, it all started for me with this book by David Vizard. I started reading it mainly because I wanted to re-engine my Morris Traveller and I wanted to tune it up so it had a bit more performance to keep up with modern traffic. I also bought books like that. And there was another book that David Bizard wrote, which was How to Build Horsepower. So I was obviously well into it. My car had been fitted with a Weber 2836 DCD for quite a long time. And after, after a few years, it began to give problems and I decided to sort of look into overhauling it. And so I went down to Southern Carburetors in Wimbledon and said, but let me show you something. So he went into the back room and came back with a box and he unpacked it. And inside that box was a 3236 DGV 5A. He says, why mess about with your 2836 when that'll bolt straight on? Gives you more clearance to put a plenum on it with a cold air system. I was really impressed. Out of the box, this thing worked apart from one tiny little floor and the tiny little floor we both had we both had the same thing and it was a very slight stumble when you were going from low rpm yeah. so for example you change down to second for a roundabout and as you go to pull away there's a and it just hesitates for a second and then it would pick up we had exactly the same on our car. Yeah. Right. Well, the, if I remember where you bought that car, brother, the yeah. guy said you will have a stumble with it, he said, yeah. because it's, he's obviously fitted them also to yeah. various vehicles. But he said, so, this, where's this stumble coming from? And whatever you did, you couldn't get rid of it entirely. And I started to think, I wonder if it's the manifold. And I was running a, um, I was running a thread on the club forums at the time called Carburetors and Special Tuning, and Chris Barker was having input on that thread along with a lot of other people, and he suddenly, from out of the blue, produced a photo of what was called the New Zealand manifold, and it was developed by a guy in New Zealand, obviously. <laughs> Carl Christensen, I think his name was, and he was a racing guy. And this photo just looked gorgeous. And I just thought, we've got to have something like that. We're not going to get rid of the stumble until we've got that. And so we got together and we started looking at places to have it made, didn't we? Yeah. For several years, the project stalled and stumbled. Potential manufacturers delivered poor quality items, deadlines were missed, 
The whole project could easily have failed without the drive to keep on trying. Jerome Sen suddenly came into the thread and said, I know the guys at Webcon over in Sunbury. Why don't we take this to them and see what they say? Once Webcon became involved, things changed significantly. So I brought it up at committee, committee level and Steve Werrell was chairman at the time. It got unanimously passed that it was worth looking into. There was now full support behind developing the Club Weber setup. So um, we went along to Webcom. We set up a meeting with Martin Eva, who's the sales manager. Peter took along cylinder head, inlet manifold, it, all the various exhaust manifolds for all the cars. Right, so our brief with this design was it had to fit all the series cars, one to five, five and it had to fit the left-hand drive bodies, particularly for Europe. Um, but that was the, it had to fit all the various models. And Martin looked at the photo of the New Zealand manifold and he said, do you know what, guys? I've seen something like that down in our archive section. So he said, we've done enough for today. Next meeting, we'll, we'll have another meeting and I'll dig that out and show it to you. So that's how we left it. And we went back for the next meeting. And God, this thing was gorgeous. But it was for a hunter. So it had the slant, the manifold had the slant for the hunter engine. Where did that come from? Well, this is it. Martin said this was commissioned by Roots, and the designer had to be Mangalezzi. Because he was like world famous at the time. And they were going to fit the Weber 3236 onto the Hunter, the GLS, maybe even the H120s. But that was why they developed that manifold. What we assume happened, we haven't got proof, but what we assume happened was that the marketing men decided that. The 32, 36 just wasn't sexy enough. They went for twin DCOEs because in a showroom, that is going to sell more cars. And so the engineers got overruled by the marketing men. But here we've got this remnant of what could have been something really special. But we've now got a slant. So... We had to get it cut and sharp. Well, I, I took it to uh, this guy, and um, we'd already decided um, to, we had to make a, an estimate for them, estimate the length of the runners to suit the left hand drive, and also to correct the angle. So, we, the drift was that he should cut the runners and shorten them, but also rectify the angle to suit what we were trying to do. Would you agree with that, Eddie? Yeah. So um, we ended up with a prototype. Peter made sure it would fit onto a cylinder head. You spent quite a long time I getting it. I spent quite a long time uh, getting it right. Yeah, uh, you know, opening out the ports to yeah. line up with the head and the gasket and making it suitable so that um, I was fairly confident yeah. that it would fit and line up properly. My friend, John Slade, volunteered his car for testing on the rolling road. So the next part of the exercise that Webcom wanted to do was to measure a standard Series 5 with the Stromberg setup because that probably produced the most horsepower out of all the various carburetors. 
and then from there we've got a baseline of what we've got to improve on because he said if we can't improve on that by at least 10 percent we're wasting our time so we've got to be able to better the original uh, setup so we brought John's car in it was very scientifically set up they checked static compression in the engine which is basically blowing compressed air down the balls with the engine doing nothing at the top dead centre and they did this for every single ball and they measured the leakage past the rings and past the valves so by varying the timing of the engine like when it was on its compression stroke they could then measure if the valves were leaking so the next thing they did was test the fuel pump and they put a pressure gauge they put a t-piece into the fuel line put a pressure gauge on it and they ran the engine and tested the fuel delivery and they only got two pounds out of the AC Delco pump. This pump is fine for a 43 horsepower Hillman Minx. If it is at all worn, this pump can struggle to feed a high performing sports car. We use the mechanical pump on our own Club Weber car. But it must be in good condition and give sufficient fuel supply or you risk leaning out at high revs. Remember the Club Weber setup is a performance upgrade for your Alpine. To avoid lean out at high RPM your pump must supply sufficient fuel. Eddie and Peter found that the standard mechanical pump on the test cars was leaning out at high RPM. So they fitted an alternative electric pump in its place. And when the RPM built up, to, so when they were doing a 60 or 70 on the motorway, the mixture's leaning out. And he said that's a classic sign of the float chamber reservoir dropping, which means the pump's not keeping pace with what the carburetor is using. So we'll have to rig up an alternative supply, otherwise the testing it's not going to work so they used the webcon four pound pump on a trolley and we rigged that up to the carburetor and that now became the fuel supply and doing that meant now we're getting proper emissions at high speed we're not getting lean out and they did the testing with the strombergs and we got a baseline figure for what the engine was putting out so that was the first part of the testing the second part of the testing was now to fit the prototype manifold the 3236 dgv take the same car in do the same rolling road test but we're still using the mexico jetting we haven't got new jetting because that's going to come later so we did that and we got about a 15% improvement in power, didn't we? Yeah. Something like 15%. And there was no stumbles. There was nothing that... I mean, John actually drove the car. And I said, to, like, before we went on to the test, I said, well, what's it like, John? He said, it's mental. That's the only way I can describe it. It's mental. So I was quite confident we were going to beat that 10%. And we got 15. So now, the question is, is getting that prototype from a prototype manifold and into production something that we can fit? As the prototype was developed for production, there were various problems that needed to be overcome. High quality and uniform sizing were essential for the production manifold. 
Despite sizing problems, pre-production manifolds were modified to fit some of the testers' cars. Although the bottom line was that Graham did manage to fit it, Jerome managed to fit his, and they both said it was a revelation. So we were on the right track. Development, design and shaping of the manifold continued throughout this period. Peter had already managed to get hold of a left-hand drive steering box casing, yeah. which he fitted to his car. Yeah. Alan, the engineer, went over to Peter's house and they measured up how far we could take the runners out and still clear the box. And so we, we ended up with our version of the New Zealand manifold. This design fits every series of Alpine, left or right-hand drive as well as various other Roots cars. And when they came back, the first production ones, it was like, yeah. oh wow, this is different class. And it really does bring out all the benefits of the Weber Carburetor. But we still haven't jetted it. So now we've got this new manifold. We take Jerome's car, which is a white Series 5, that goes on the rolling road and they do all the calibration of the jets and I can't tell you what the jet sizes are because that's intellectual property but what I can tell you is there's virtually none of the jets from the Mexico are left in the carburetor that so everything's changed so they're vastly different what I found with mine is that I was able to put the carburetor and manifold on the car and it flew immediately. Yeah. It didn't need anything doing to it. It just no. absolutely. There's flew. only one setting that you have to get right, and that's the mixture control. Once you've done that and you just reset your idle speed, that's all you need. Because all the calibration is in the jet sizes. There's nothing to wear in that carburetor except the throttle spindle. You just don't have to, there's no needle, no needle like there is in the Stromberg, nothing to wear at all. So it's fit and forget. And that's what we wanted. Yeah. When you do all this, you obviously want to make sure your points are in good condition, the spark plugs, and above all, the ignition timing needs to be set with a strobe. Yeah. And, and, we, then, and we, then you're, you're somewhere We found there. 12 degrees before top dead centre. Yeah was the sweet spot for the Alpine. It didn't matter which series of car it is, if you just put that in. I think the feedback that we got from the club, gradually people started fitting it and they realised the cars never run like this ever. You know, and and I was getting forty seven miles to the gallon on the motorway at seventy mile an hour. And I, I've had forty um, 42 I think it's the best I've had but I've had a genuine 40 uh, a couple of times now and that's yeah. measured with, with a tracker so I know it's exactly right with the mileage yeah. there's no discrepancy on the speed yeah. but it is such a great bit of kit and yeah. very much down down to you guys yeah. yeah and it just goes to show you that the, the engine was always and, uh, capable of doing uh, that but it never got the right car for it but uh, now it has. Gone so low what low. would you say to people who say that uh, oh, it's not really the manifold, you could just put a G DGV on the, the log manifold? No, you can't because David Vizar proved that log manifolds are the worst thing you can do because gases do not like going round corners. And what happens with the log manifold, if you ever took your spark plugs out and looked at them, one and four were always darker than two and three. Why is that? Well, what was happening was the fuel is suspended in the air as droplets, little minute droplets, but they're heavier than air. So when that gas goes round the corner, the droplets carry straight on. They've got inertia. They hit the wall of the manifold, condense, you get a puddle of fuel uh, in both one and four, the and it's running rich all the time. So half your engine's been kiboshed with that manifold. So, uh, 
Right, okay. Um, Eddie, I know that when you got the jetting right, you took it back to the rolling road that you jetted, is that right? Yeah, we, we took the car back to the rolling road and instead of 15%, we got 17%. So Web, Webcom were really pleased at this stage. And there was talk after that. In fact, you even got involved in producing a trigger wheel, didn't yeah, you, with Alan? I did, yeah. So there was talk of producing a turnkey fuel injection system for the Alpine based on a 3236 throttle body, the new manifold, and four point injection. Well, that's something to look forward to if you can get that into production, guys. That really will be a flyer. But for now, I think we'll have to live with the carburetor, which uh, will yes. make a, a huge difference. After we'd finished filming, we found out that Alpine Innovations have continued with the development of a fuel injection system for the Alpine. You will soon be able to buy an off-the-shelf fuel injection conversion specifically made for the Alpine. It's great that the Alpine continues to be developed so many years after production ended. So, um, what are you going to go for next then? An electric Alpine? <laughs> Well, the trouble is then, I think it'd be so heavy, you'd probably have trouble yeah. pulling it along. I think you're probably right. I think yeah. we've got proper sports cars with the Alpine. Yeah. Them, we? Okay, so if I wanted to, to go and buy another one of these carburetors, who do I do? Do I come and contact you guys? Well, the club have got their own web concealer in Alpine Innovations. So you can only buy this through Alpine Innovation because none of the other weather dealers will have the jetting kit or the manifold or any of the bits and pieces you need that drone gone to a lot of trouble to make like the throttle linkage. It's really a complete solution for the Alpine owner. Well, Alpine and, Innovations really have shown themselves to be innovative here, haven't yeah, they? I mean, we've no connection with them. Innovative they've made and they've got really good quality components and it's tried and tested everybody that has fitted this has been pleased with it i don't think i've heard any detractors at all no i've never heard anybody no. say a bad word about it personally i recommend it to anyone who's got an alpine yeah absolutely yeah yeah Okay, guys, well, I think everyone who's got an Alpine or a similar route vehicle with one of these carburetors has got a, a big debt to you too. And, and on behalf of all of us, thank you for everything that, that you did. We've had your carburetor on our car now for about three or four years. We've done thousands and thousands of miles and we've never touched it. No. We just do get in the car, turn the key and off it goes. Yeah. I thoroughly yeah. recommend it. It's a really good bit of kit. Okay, well... Peter Pesco and Eddie Zetlin, thank you very much for your time today. Thank okay, you're Tim. welcome. Thanks. We'd like to say thanks to Eddie Zetlin and Peter Pesco. The UK Sunbeam Alpine Owners Club were key supporters of Eddie and Peter and ensured that the club Weber reached production. Webcon ensured that the initial idea progressed into a production ready manifold. Alpine Innovations are the sole suppliers of the Club Weber carburetor and curved manifold setup. We have no connection with Alpine Innovations other than as satisfied customers. We paid full price for all carburetors purchased. This is the Sunbeam Alpine channel, your channel for all things Sunbeam Alpine. Please subscribe and like our videos. If you subscribe, we can let you know every time we publish a new one.